welcome back everyone to yet another episode of Going for Two, presented by Home Field Apparel. I am your host, the publisher of the Extra Points newsletter, co-host of the show, Matt Brown uh, of Extra Points. I'm joined here by Brian Fisher, my colleague here within the D1 Ticker family, my podcast co-host. Uh, how you holding up, man? Uh, holding up is, is a relative term, I think, for everybody, especially as uh, somebody who's dealing with two young kids right now as my coworkers, as we uh, we were chatting about uh, before coming on here. But uh, busy week in college athletics, surprisingly so. You know, it, it seemed like it was going to be one of those quiet weeks and then uh, suddenly a, a wild explosion of, of new stories. It, it happened pretty quickly. This was one of the, I think the, the, the few weeks where I felt like I've actually had a minute to catch my breath. Um, you know, kind of in between bigger stories and, and working through a couple of things. But uh, we, we do want to take a, a couple of minutes, you know, first to talk about a few of the biggest stories uh, from this week that maybe we didn't turn into extra points newsletters or, you know, spin off into Collegiate Sports Connect videos or anything that we want to, we want to talk about. Uh, and then we also solicited some mailbag questions. It's been a minute since we took some questions here from our readers and from our uh, from our, our listeners. Uh, you can, of course, if you had another question on your mind, you can always shoot me a DM uh, at Matt Brown EP or shoot me an email at Matt at ExtraPointsMB.com. Um, on the conference realignment front, which has uh, stubbornly refused to slow down even for an instant to the point where even I can't keep track of everything here, uh, we saw uh, another institution join the Colonial Athletic Association, the NCANT. Uh, made 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 the made the jump, and they had their leadership go and uh, and I think speak surprisingly frankly about the department's long term ambitions and what's going to be required for them to compete at this level. Uh, it's between jumping from the MEAC to the Big South to the Colonial. Um, that, that that's definitely going to necessitate some significant budget increases, huh? Yeah, I mean that that was the one thing that kind of caught my eye. And uh, if you're you know following along on D1 Ticker, or you haven't subscribed already on on Fridays uh, when you're hopefully listening to this podcast. There's a list of the top ten stories that uh, you know college athletics leaders are uh, looking at. So that that email comes out on on Friday afternoons as well. This is obviously one of those big time stories, uh, you know, around around college athletics. And the thing that you're right that caught my eye was just the the amount of spend that NCAA and T is is kind of looking at. You know, up to twenty five million dollars, uh, kind of. Is, is what their ideal goal, I guess you could say, is and, and what they kind of understand is going to be the undertaking uh, with this move to CA, which, um, you know, certainly an eyebrow raising figure. You know, it, it's a it's a significant increase from what they're currently doing. Um, but I mean, you you look at some of those other CAA programs, you look at what kind of FCS and football in schools are, are in general are doing right now in terms of where they're trending. Um, yeah, yeah that, that sounds like a pretty accurate number to me. And I, I think that speak to some of their ambitions, not just with this move, but in terms of, hey, we, we understand it, it's a, a move that necessitates that that capital uh, injection as well. Yeah, I mean, I mean, relative to other HBCUs, I, I think A and T has um, done a pretty good job of finding ways to to, to raise other revenue, wh whether that was through sponsorship or naming rights for their stadium, uh, whether that was you know being more aggressive, maybe, maybe sending some other peers uh, with 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 third party sponsorship money, knowing, knowing what they need to compete. But now, even with James Madison leaving the Colonial, this is still. A strong FCS league. Villanova is a good is a good program. Uh, Richmond is historically a good program. Delaware is a good program, and these are also schools that are prepared to spend, you know, you know, pretty significant money at the FCS level. Like we, we talk a lot about the exploding cost curve, or uh, of FBS football, whether that's through coaching salaries or uh, facilities or NIL or what or what have you. Um, that, that's not something you can do on the cheap. That's Cost uh, you know, trajectory is not the same at the FCS level, but it's definitely not remaining flat. So that that's going to be something to watch. It's, this is um, it's not going to be as good of a league, I think, in the immediate term as it was maybe three or four years ago. I, I would say the Missouri Valley and the Big Sky are uh, not insignificantly stronger and deeper FCS football leagues right now. But depending on, on what happens with Stony Brook, depending on what happens with AT, and quite frankly, depending on what happens with the rest of other realignment moves, because I'm hearing the CAA may not be done, um, both in terms of adding teams, maybe even in terms of losing teams. We don't know exactly what this is going to look like in 2024, but if, if those moves break the right way, this should still be a very strong league. 
And, and look, in NCAA T, a very strong football program. You know, they've had a lot of success. You know, recently, you know, they, yeah. they won celebration bowls out there. That they, they've turned out some NFL draft picks. Like this is a, a pretty overall successful program, uh, much of the past you know decade, decade and a half. And so, um, yeah, I think they're they're obviously located in an interesting area in terms of the CAA and, and kind of expanding, um, you know, that that footprint and, and where they're at. And I think it's going to be just uh, a unique challenge, you know, for that school uh, in terms of the step up in competition. Because you're right, you know, like Villanova, they they've been a regular. Uh, making the FCS playoffs. You know, you, you mentioned Delaware. Obviously, they've had a ton of success uh, historically. So um, it, it's just going to be a unique league. And, and and you're right about kind of maybe being a, a step behind uh, the MVFC. I mean, look, obviously, you have North Dakota State in your league. You're, you're going to be a little bit uh, kind of a head and shoulders above everybody else just having that kind of a powerhouse. But uh, you look at South Dakota, North Dakota. I mean, some of the other schools around North Dakota State, they've come along in terms of football as well. And they had a really successful season this past year in terms of the FCS playoffs. Uh, yeah. The Skies had uh, a lot of success recently as well uh, with a lot of their teams. And uh, I think it's going to be a, a unique challenge for the CAA to kind of play a little bit of catch up. But they're in in the right areas, you know, I think for the, them to be able to make an impact and, and certainly land a, a lot of recruits in, in areas that uh, might get overlooked. And, and I think it's going to be a new, unique challenge. We've also talked about, you know, the OVC and, and, and the Big South, you know, certainly in having their access uh, in, in the last episode to the FCS playoffs. But I, I think just kind of the realignment going on amongst a lot of these FCS leagues is something that, uh, like you said, we're, we're going to continue to track. And is something that is going to be a story, I think, really throughout the, the entire summer. I, I think so too. We are closer to being done than uh, we were maybe a month ago. And a couple of the mailbag questions, you know, bring this up. So we, we, we can save that a little bit later in the show. But uh, I definitely don't think we're finished yet. The Big South and the uh, OVC's uh, um, you know, football merger, which we talked about earlier this week on Extra Points, that link is in the show notes. Uh, I think we'll maybe remove some of the immediate urgency for either of those two leagues to try to add teams. Certainly the big South, I think was really kind of behind the eight ball there for a minute, but uh, I'm hearing the colonial would still love to have Howard. And if they have to add somebody else to get Howard, then then maybe they'll end up doing that. Um, I would not be completely blown away if any of these Southern schools in the colonial decide, maybe they don't want to keep going up to New York uh, for everything all the time. Maybe there are opportunities for them that, that make a little bit more regional sense. Um, I've been, I've, I don't think that story's done. Uh, there is another big FCS football related story that, that became official uh, on Thursday, but Brian, I, I mean, I, I knew about this about a week earlier. So I'm guessing that, that you did too, uh, about a certain FCS program making a high profile coaching hire, right? Well, I mean, I think the, the news obviously leaked uh, a little bit earlier that Grambling was was going to hire Art Bryles as their OC. And uh, you kind of thought maybe that was just a bit of a trial balloon for the administration to kind of gauge yeah. the reaction and and see if they needed to pull the plug. But uh, that has not been the case. You know, they've gone full steam ahead. And Art Bryles is the the new OC at Grambling. And uh, just my, mind-blowing, really. I think that was kind of the reaction amongst a lot of the college football media, uh, a lot of fans in general, just like, how can you still hire Art Bryles? You know, especially for Hugh Jackson, who – Really, a couple of weeks ago, uh, which, you know, was was really in the thick of things in terms of uh, talking about minority coaches and, and giving them shots and making sure they have the right opportunities. Uh, coming out of that Brian Flores lawsuit and his time yeah. in Cleveland, uh, and and you know he was like on an ESPN and, and the NFL Network, and he was talking all about uh, you know these opportunities, and then he pulls Art Bryles off the scrap heap, you know, and gives him a lifeline that uh, nobody really wanted to give him. And I, I just it does not make sense um, for for Hugh Jackson and that program, in, in my opinion. I really don't get why the administration is kind of giving their blessing to this because you think this is this is really a moment for HBCUs. You know, we, obviously everything happening at Jackson State. Um, you know, Eddie George is up there and, and already talking about uh, you know in, in increasing funding for for some of those OVC schools and, and maybe even moving leagues. But like uh, th this is a big time moment. Um, you know, even Campbell was was featured on 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 the homepage at ESPN. You know, it's like a, a big time moment for for FCS programs, um, for for HBCUs in general, and. and uh, I think this is throwing a lot of goodwill you know, out, out the door uh, at Grambling, a, a program that does need to kind of get back on track. Obviously, you know, a ton of history there that they, they can lean on. And you just yeah. want to point, why, why, why are you leaning on Art Bryles? Like it, it just it makes no sense. And and I, I think they're they're rightfully going to get a lot of pushback, you know, this week. Um, I think it's going to continue. I think there's going to be a large drumbeat. Um, you know, we, we've seen this happen in the past, right? You know, Art Bryles uh, had to go up into Canada. And and there were, he was he was hired by a Canadian CFL franchise. 
franchise and uh, ended up, uh, you know, there was such backlash that uh, that that hire got rescinded. Maybe that's going to happen here again. But um, certainly it, it was a unique situation with uh, everything going on there in, in, in the university and and the football program. But uh, one that doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. So you are being very polite and 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 uh, and measured here uh, in your criticism. Well, you know, let me give you my reaction. This shit sucks. Like I, I, I don't, I don't think that we, we need to dress this up on, 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 on any level, right? You're exactly right. Where this is a great way for an institution that has the moral high ground uh, and is uh, approaching a, 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 an opportunity for them to reach even more national prominence than they've had in a while to set that on fire, um, to set on fire this idea of, 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 of trying to seize the moral high ground with, with, with promoting uh, coaches of color. Which, which is which is what's wild here, right? There's there's a whole lot of, of coaches who can coach ball and know about offensive systems um, who do not have Art Wiles baggage who, who could have had an opportunity for this gig. It sucks because not only did this leak twice, one, Grambling's administration lied about it. And I, I know that you could have just said, we have no comment or we can't comment on potential hires or this person's not a university employee right now. Instead, it's like, no, there's the speculation. There's there's no truth to this when either you damn well knew or you should have known and then should have said no comment until you did know. Jackson State's administration did the same thing about Dion, saying that Dion Sanders wasn't a candidate when everybody knew he was a candidate and then surprised that they announced him. So that sucks, right? It sucks to announce this in the middle of maybe World War III um, and then uh, also while the campus is closed for Mardi Gras. Uh, and, and then to have your, your university not give any extra information and delegate that to a sit-down interview with a third-party radio station. That shit sucks. So what, I understand why they did it. And, and it's a lot of it, Brian, I think is for some of the same reasons that you were talking about before, where Grambling has an enormous, deep, rich uh, uh, football history. This was... For a long time, the like the flagship football HBCU, and there are people that are close to Grambling that um, deeply resent the fact that right now that's Jackson State, not necessarily just on the field, but in terms of energy and mojo and 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 what what's trying to grab this national moment. That's where, where you're going to have people that think that should be Grambling. Um, and so then I we're seeing this with a couple other schools. Then, well, what did Jackson State do to get to this point? Let's try to emulate that strategy by bringing in the biggest NFL names that we possibly can and the biggest established people. Art Browse knows how to coach football. That's never been in dispute. But to then uh, delegate the answers to how will you keep grambling students safe? Uh, why has this individual earned the benefit of the doubt? And to not man up and take those questions and specifically time this um to the point where it's when you're when when campus isn't open and when you're not going to face the, the those same kind of tough questions those, those tough questions that sucks it's it's a bad decision for football reasons it's a worse decision for for moral reasons and if you are trying to build up your program to go to catch more of this attention you guys got to build up your administrative capacity to handle everything that comes with that you can't say I want more attention we want to be big time and then hide when big time questions and big time cameras come in that's that's it, it, that it makes me legitimately upset. There's there's nothing to celebrate about this, and I want to celebrate Grambling football. Well, that that is well said, my friend. And and, and look, I, I think it is important to kind of keep in mind that with a lot of these HBCUs, you mentioned the administrative uh, kind of yeoman's work that that has to be put into a lot of these, not only just these hires, but kind of building these programs back up. Um, yeah. You know, a lot of it is just work that that hasn't been done. It has been prioritized by a lot of these universities. Some of some of them certainly have, but um, well, when it comes to dealing with media requests, when it comes to like the the small things that you would think uh, about building around some of these the, these really historically great programs. Um, you know, corners get cut and, and a lot of administrators almost have like a, some, some blinders on. Right. And, and, and I feel like you you kind of get trapped in your own little world, which happens in general at, at a lot of campuses, but lot of campuses. it feels like at, at some of these schools, um, you know, it's just, uh, you know, they 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 put on the, an extra set of blinders, you know, and, and like they, they just are not thinking about the bigger picture. And, yeah. um, I, I just, I, I do a lot of work with the FWA, um, you know, one of, one of the highlights every year at, at the national title game is, is uh, going to the Eddie, Eddie Robinson 
uh, award uh, for, for the coach of the year uh, that, that we're heavily involved in with, with the Sugar Bowl. And you know, just a great presentation. Got, got to, to meet uh, Eddie's uh, family, um, you know, his, his son and, and some of his, his grandsons and, and whatnot uh, that they are heavily involved in that world. Uh, world. And uh, it, it just sucks for them because I, I think it really it does put a big stain uh, on, on Grambling, uh, uh, the football program and, and the university itself. And, and the way they've handled it has just kind of poured water to this fire. And um, it, it's going to be interesting to kind of track over these next couple of weeks. Um, ultimately, what what ends up happening, because I, I can definitely see a world where, um, you know, once once Mardi Gras does come down in, the, in that state and everybody kind of says, well, hey, wait a minute, they, they, they hired our, that Art Browse? Yeah, that, that Art Browse. Real, real quick, just in, in case people have forgotten, here's a direct quote from the NCAA panel that ta- that looked into Art Browse. He said, uh, Mr. Browse has failed to meet even the most basic expectations of how a person should react to the kind of conduct at issue in this case. The kind of conduct, of course, rampant sexual assault of students on campus. That's not, I ran afoul of the, of the bagel laws with the NCAA. It's not that uh, maybe I was too friendly with the bag man. It was, I failed to do the basic human standards for anybody who is supposed to be an adult watching over uh, you know, in, in, other individuals at a school of higher learning. Um, I hate it. I hate it. I, 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 I don't want to hate it. And it's, 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 uh, it's, it's unfortunate. Um, well, I mean, for a lot of these HBCUs yeah. in, in, in general, like you talk about the, the university's mission and, and the football program's kind of mission in terms of developing, you know, character, developing these people for, for their next step in their lives. And uh, it, it does, it just kind of flies in the face of all that, you know, like they should be developing these young men, uh, you know, in terms of uh, what they need to do on and off the field. And this, this is just a, a hire that, that reeks of saying, you know, we're, we're going to skip out on that because we think we can win an extra game or two, which Honestly, you know, uh, given the the, the 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 amount of time that Art Prowse has been out of the, the college game and, and, and just kind of the th- world he's getting thrown into uh, with, with FCS football and, and being at Grambling, like I, I, I'm not even sure it, it makes sense from a, a football perspective uh, for this hire. And, and uh, you know, I think it's uh, Hugh Jackson was was a, an interesting eyebrow raising hire to, to begin with, and and even more so now with with all this controversy surrounding both him and, and his program right now. And, and it's going to take a lot to kind of dig out from. Uh, uh, whether you're Grambling, whether you're the the Grambling administration, whether you're a Grambling fan, or whether you're just an HBCU or FCS football fan, I, I think it just sucks for sucks all around, and um, we're we're, we're going to see, I'm, I'm sure, some additional blowback that the, the coming weeks and months. Yeah, yeah, that that you know, that's to, to, I guess the to get the last word. I mean, like all that's right. This was I was saying this to a couple of other colleagues. Like our Bryles is going to be like what 67 heading heading into the season. I mean, like. To, the guy looks like crap. And like I, I know that, like I know what I look like. I know I'm not supposed to be throwing like throwing stones here. Um, but when you hire an NFL guy that doesn't have isn't isn't a, a big a, a college person, and you need to fill out your staff now with recruiters and people that can relate to 19 year olds, um, bringing in and this. We've seen this problem with other NFL guys that come in and coach college programs as they come in with other NFL people, people that they know. It looks like it looks like Hugh and Art are friends. With, Great. Um, but even if they're all upstanding people and deacons in their church and and give money to charity and definitely don't cover up sexual assault, there's a huge learning curve. Like ask Lovey. Like th- this is part of why Illinois didn't work out, especially in the very beginning, because you had a bunch of NFL guys. I mean, ask, that- ask, you mentioned Ask Lovey. I mean, look at the, the other kind of bigger story, especially at West that, that happened this week in terms of Michael Crow and, and Ray Anderson going on radio, kind of defending Herman Edwards. So he wasn't even involved in it's, and it's like they, they said he wasn't even involved in, in some of these NCAA violations when when the NCAA and, and, and a lot of the reports like we, we know he was involved. He was heavily involved. And like yeah. to say that was was really a, kind of a slap in the face for I, I know a lot of ASU folks were, were rightfully upset, both in the administration for, for those comments that came out this week uh, coming out of Tempe and and as well as you know just kind of ASU fans like they, they, they are definitely over this experiment. And, and the fact that the, the administration there continues to kind of defend their guy in, in the face of everything. I mean, it, it just, it just, uh, it just doesn't make sense. And no. <laughs> that seems it's, like it's, it's maddening. It, 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 it's, it didn't make sense six months ago. I think you and I talked about this, like, all right, you've got an experienced quarterback. You brought in a, a, a highly regarded recruiting class two years ago, and maybe you think you might make the Rose Bowl. So you're going to go all in on a guy who's very clearly about to set your department on fire with the NCAA. Lots of schools make that bet. Uh, I'm not saying it's good or bad, but like, that's the bet. And they kind of sucked. 
and now they signed a hor horrific recruiting class. Your, your experienced quarterback, who allegedly you basically made his mom an assistant coach. Um, you, you 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 put all your chips in here, and you had a two and a seven. Uh, and what most administrations would do would be then to make lots of changes, particularly because you can win at Arizona State. Um, you can win in a lot of different sports at Arizona State. You probably should. Uh, and you can win in a way that doesn't embarrass you the way that ASU has. And they are not, they've elected to make a different decision so far, um, which is certainly a thing you could do. Uh, good news good news for Utah fans, though, and, and good news for Lincoln Riley, I guess. Um, Governor's Cup should be fun now that Arizona has decided to actually get football players on their team. Um, we'll see how that goes. Well, I think that, I mean, the Pac-12 kind of moving forward is obviously one of kind of the big, interesting thought experiments, obviously, uh, given that they're kind of being in this lame duck situation with with the college football playoff not expanding. Obviously, you've got the, the excitement surrounding Lincoln Riley. Um, you know, so you mentioned Utah. I mean, obviously, coming off a, a thrilling Rose Bowl, uh, you know, run that they, they've had and, and really a program position to kind of take advantage from from a lot of those other teams uh, being down right now. I mean, it's it's a unique league. Uh, certainly. And uh, one of the more interesting kind of subplots is just what what, what the heck is going on in the, in the state of Arizona. Two programs that, that should be a lot better, you know, have all the resources, you know, they, they have uh, a growing talent base, you know, that you know, back when Todd Graham was there, he was able to reach into California and uh, Texas and, and had success on that trail. I know the, the ending probably uh, not exactly what, uh, what he or, or some of the ASU fans wanted, but um, the fact that you know, the program actually got worse, you know, after, after letting him go, um, I think speaks volume to kind of the, the bad decisions that have gone on there in Tempe. Yeah. Well, speaking of better decisions, uh, well, you, you thought I'm going to not do the, I'm not doing the ad read now. I'm not, I'm not doing that for home field. We'll, we'll, we'll give, we'll give a little bit of space there. Um, we do want to take a couple of questions that we've received here on Twitter, uh, via email, uh, that, that, that folks here have, uh, have asked us about. Uh, I want to dig in here. Uh, there's been a couple of good ones. Uh, extra points reader, uh, going for to listener, BRF1 asks on Twitter, if we have any new information about the status of the EA Sports College football game, where does EA stand on signing agreements with the schools? Well, my man, you're in luck. I know a couple of things about this. So here's, here is what I can tell you based on what I've been hearing so far. Um, the uh, EA Sports is very optimistic that they will be able to use the likenesses, uh, the stadiums, the intellectual property of all 133 FBS institutions that will be playing in 2023. I say one. Uh, I say 133, even though there's only 130 right now, because I've been told that James Madison, Jacksonville State, and Sam Houston will all be in the game. That they have. That they have uh, worked to. Uh, quickly send over the, the correct images necessary for their stadium rendering, uh, the stuff about mascots, the stuff about uniforms and logos. That's apparently pretty simple to add in. It's the it's the stadium. That's the hardest part, and, and that's actually happening. We actually we had a story about this a couple of days ago on Extra Points where I interviewed a football player at Troy who actually took the pictures and, and went in there and gathered the assets. It's like it's like hundreds of pictures that, that have to be picked in there. The, the sent over, it's, it's a gigantic – like uh, just in terms of like hard drive space <laughs> to, to send all of this stuff to, to get it uploaded. Um, I have also been told that EA has not closed the door on uh, including FCS programs. Although as of what I have heard right now, the best knowledge I've heard at this minute is that those would not be included at launch. And furthermore, that it's unlikely that all of their stadiums will be in if, if they're included at all, just because like the stadium part, that's a big load. Um, as far as the teams themselves being in the game, uh, people may remember that uh, one of the sticking points for Notre Dame, Northwestern, Tulane, a handful of other programs, including some that I don't think made this public, was we don't want to let our stuff be in the game unless our athletes can be paid. Uh, and when and this was ancient history, when this game was first announced, uh, there wasn't a mechanism to do that. I would expect before June, like really pretty soon, that EA Sports will announce a group licensing agreement, either with Brandar or with Learfield or some other agency, potentially more than one, to uh, to begin to, to pay athletes in the mid to high four figures a piece to appear each to appear in the game. There have been enough schools now that have signed group licensing arrangements to handle apparel sales and um, collectibles and other goods that now there is a mechanism to actually make this happen. 
I can't tell you about features yet. I promise if I if I find out, I will share them. I have been told that once the game is far enough along in the development cycle, uh, somebody from EA Sports will come on this podcast to discuss it because we were relentless in writing about the minutia of this game. But we're not there yet. I, the only thing I think I, I feel comfortable telling you is um, it's going to be on the new PlayStation and new Xbox console systems. I don't think it's going to be on the PC. And there's going to be some kind of ultimate team mode, which is the case in, in every kind of uh, game right now. I think I think that's what I got. Um, I, I, I just, just kind of stepping yeah. back. It's almost like, you know, I, I love the dynasty mode, you know, back in the day when you had the, the NCAA video game, but like they, yeah. they almost need like a conference realignment mode, you know, where you can kind of take your school from conference to conference, maybe just, just throwing it out there, EA, just yeah. giving me some suggestions. But I think it's important to keep in mind too, that this is the first edition, right? Oh, like, yeah. like it's going to evolve as a game. There are going to be multiple editions. Obviously, you know, I think it's it's coming at a unique time in, in terms of the gaming marketplace with, you know, yeah. kind of streaming consoles. You know, you mentioned the Xbox uh, and not being on a PC. Well, you can play Xbox games on your PC now. So it's like it, things are things are different. Every a lot, Obviously, there's a lot of huge focus on mobile. Um, you know, it, it's, it's going to be an interesting space, too, because, um, you know, you mentioned transactions and stuff. You, you can definitely see a world where you throw a touchdown as – you know caleb williams and he you know you turn that into an nft he gets a cut ea gets cut and and you and you own that nft like you, you can definitely see that being kind of the in-game transactional thing uh, that that ends up happening out of this which would be pretty cool for for a lot of those kids uh, i'm sure not just to to make the money but to kind of see them see them in real life you know in, in terms of that video game and and uh, getting getting a cut out of that but uh, a unique world that that game is returning to and certainly one that we will be wasting quite a few hours on oh uh, I, I mean i can't wait i can't i can't wait like, I, I will say this like i i um i feel like i have been too busy to really jump into any triple a video game over the last several months so like I, I might have 20 minutes free and it's too cold for me to do any woodworking right now so the game that i typically play is nba 2k i play the ultimate team mode in nba 2k the my team i'm not very good because i don't spend i don't really spend much money on it and i don't i can't play uh to make it my job so I would, if i play online i'm going to lose to some 12 year olds who will say rude things about my family but the new season of my team i think starts today uh, on Friday, and it's going to include a Duke basketball player, which you can add to your squad, I, I think, for free. Uh, he's wearing his Duke uniform. He's currently a student. Like, that's the first guy, uh, Paulo, the, to to be a current college athlete and be in a video game. The world, I don't think, will end today. If it does, we had a good run. Uh, but I, if, it, if it does, it probably isn't because of NBA 2K. So this is a, a teaser for what I would I expect right now the next video game uh, to, to look like on that note, incidentally enough, my, and we're going to, we're going to talk about this more next week. I, my, I heard that during their press conference uh, to join the Ohio Valley, uh, Lindenwood's athletic administration said, Hey, we're going to be in the next video game. Well, uh, maybe you will be as a DLC, but uh, I, w when we talk to people at Lindenwood next week, stay tuned uh, on going for two. Uh, we will, we will talk about that a little bit more. I don't know. Maybe he, maybe, so maybe EA told them something that no, they haven't told me yet, or that I haven't, I haven't found on um, FOIA requests. Uh, looking through here, another question that I think is uh, is potentially interesting here. We got a. This may be more of your world here than mine. Uh, Reader Peyton asks: Will the Big Twelve be better or worse at basketball after Texas and Oklahoma leave? It's kind of a tough season for basketball here for Oklahoma. Um, I don't know. It, it actually, it might be better. I, I think it might, it might depend on who's coaching the the incoming programs. Houston's real good, um, and is is has been able to re add talent both through high school and through the portal at a at a way that you wouldn't expect from a non power program. Like that's going to be, I think, a perennial top four seed if, if they keep everybody there. Uh, BYU has really fallen apart over the last two and a half weeks of the season, but they looked like a, a lock for the NCAA tournament. They were a top twenty-five team for for a lot a lot of this year. UCF has been a you know pretty consistently close to a, a tournament level team. Cincinnati wants to be more of a just a tournament level team. They want to be a Sweet Sixteen you know team, and 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 then they've been there before. So I don't know about you, like that seems like a that seems like a league that's good as hell. Like I mean, who's the worst team? TCU. Like in, in that league, and that's still a team that can make the tournament. 
Yeah, but I mean, you mentioned TCU. I mean, they got Jamie Dixon there. I, th- I think they've had you know some 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 success there, and, and obviously they, they have a new arena there for for TCU. So like they, they, there's been investment you know throughout the Big Twelve. I, I think it is going to be a better league. Uh, you know, yeah, you hate to lose the kind of flagship brand name programs like Texas and OU, but I mean, in terms of hoops, that they, they've got it made pretty well. I mean, you got Baylor obviously uh, coming off the national championship, a, a program that does take basketball seriously. They're building a new arena. Um, you know that that you know is going to be a little bit more compact, but but I think they're, they're they're excited over uh, the prospect of, of what's going on there in Waco. Uh, you mentioned Houston. I think that's obviously a program, um, you know, who, who certainly when when uh, their head coach retires is, is going to go through a little transition. Obviously, they had that planned out a little bit, um, but uh, in, in a talent rich area, they can attract guys, like you said, through the portal coming back to Houston. If they ended up leaving, uh, coming out of high school, I think uh, Cincinnati certainly takes basketball very seriously. And, oh, yeah. and, you know, that that is like half the battle, you know, certainly. And, you know, even schools like you look at Kansas State, you know, I think they're, they're facing a, a big time, you know, kind of uh, transition year, you know, Know, certainly now with with what what's going on with Bruce Weber and whether he'll return, um, you know that that's a program that can probably get back on track. You know they uh, certainly have Kansas uh, out there and, and still doing Kansas things, um, regardless of what the NCAA is trying to say or, or do to them. So Look, I mean they got they got tenure, baby. Br- bring on the sanctions. He's not going anywhere. Like they're 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 going to be what they are. And, and, and even like, you know, Oklahoma State, you know, like they, they've had some success recently that they've landed the number one recruit a couple of years ago. Like they, 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 they've obviously been invested in, in having that basketball success as well. So like in terms of is it a better league um, without Oklahoma and Texas? I mean, it, it's tough because so much of that league is an identity built on football and losing those two brand names is going to hurt in terms of those revenues when it comes to TV dollars. But if you're just looking at the core men's basketball product i think you can even extend it into women's given some of the programs involved as well i mean i i think it is a better league uh kind of overall when when you kind of add uh at at the bottom and and really kind of strengthen that middle of the pack as well um i I think it's it's a league that could you know be right up there with the big east and and the acc for for years to come yeah let me me, me go go one more question real quick and then let's let's uh let's show for our sponsors here for a second I'm having trouble finding the exact tweet, but I had three different people ask about variations of this. One, do we expect any other Division II institutions to reclassify following Lindenwood? And two, what can both Division I and Division II do to um, limit the number of or of teams to do that are doing this, or, or perhaps de-incentivize them? So, uh, Brian, if you have heard anything different, by all means. But uh, what I can tell you right now is. Uh, I would put the over under on like two. I think that uh, division two schools that could reclassify this year and, and where that might happen might surprise you a little bit because I, I think the conventional message board wisdom and the schools that I get asked about a lot are usually in Texas or in the Southeast. And what I've been hearing right now is, and this is, this has changed, I think over the past couple of months, but I think it is less likely any of the other Lone Star institutions end up reclassifying right now. Midwestern, Angelo, uh, West Texas administration, I think really, you know, it'll publish something pretty clear about, hey, we're not trying to compete with A&M. We are happy where we are right now. We think that's the best possible student experience. I think as long as there is a league for them, I I, I, I think this, the smart money is that they're going to stay at that level. And so that, and those are, that's been a commonly assumed um, promotion that might happen with the Southland. Uh, Central Oklahoma, I think is, is also in that group. I, I, I my, what the best intelligence I've heard at this minute is that that's less likely to happen this year. Same thing for West Florida. Same thing for the, the the big programs in Georgia. Where I do think this could happen this year would be, one, another institution potentially joining the Ohio Valley. There's been a couple other Division II schools that I know that they've had conversations with that are on that radar. Lincoln Memorial is one of them. That's a pretty small school in Tennessee that has a couple of uh, very motivated benefactors uh, that, that, that's been an athletically uh, you know, strong program at that level. Grand Valley in, in Michigan is one, although they got to figure out, are we, are, you know, where, where's our, are, are we going to have all of our sports in one league? Is our football going to go somewhere else? Is our league still viable? Like that's a division two school that's athletic profile and institutional profile looks a lot more like a Mac school, I think, than Hope College or, or some other, you know, schools at that level. Um, University of Indianapolis is, is, is one that I've, I've heard is the least thinking about it maybe I, I I don't I wouldn't I wouldn't say that's that that's likely the place where I would look the most honestly right now would be division two schools in the Northeast given that the America East is likely to take one or more schools from the NEC or the Mac the Mac may take 
one or more schools from the NEC or perhaps elsewhere. Um, so uh, if, and if the NEC needs anybody, which they very well might, if they don't end up merging with anybody else, would be from the Northeast 10 uh, or from other Division II schools in that region, whether that's New Haven, whether that's Lemoyne, whether that's Adelphi, whether that's a couple, I mean, I, I pick a pick a Division II school that's balancing its budget and is okay at basketball. That's, I think that might be the more, the bigger ground zero. Does, does that kind of match with, with maybe what you've heard around the campfire? It does. I mean, I, ironically, you know, I mentioned Lindenwood uh, earlier for for what we're going to do next week, and and their former conference home of the MIAA uh, was actually spoke to with their commissioner uh, for collegiate sports connect this week, Mike Gracie, and uh, That's you know, right. he, he kind of said, um, you know, he, he does have to kind of keep an, an an ear to the ground to kind of see what what's happening. I, I do anticipate, you know, like you said, the Northeast. I mean, just obviously the basketball tradition up there, you know, kind of lends itself to maybe making that jump to where you can kind of get into the just the allure of the, that NCAA tournament. But uh, I think you. There are really generally two camps, right? You have the kind of first camp that says, you know what, there's a whole lot of transformation going on right now. We, we, we don't know what essentially that uh, that barrier for entry is going to be in terms of division one going yep. forward. Let, let's jump now and and we'll find, try to find a home and we'll kind of deal with things as, as we go. Then there's kind of that second tier of the universities that I, that I think – are, are looking at the trans, you know, transformation and, and what's going on with D1 and D2, and, and they're certainly very happy um, in, in, in their current homes. But um, when they kind of know what, what, what the immediate and, and, and long-term future of Division One is um, and, and what those requirements might be, what kind of money they might have to put up um, to make some of that transition uh, happen, um, I think then you're once once that is kind of known and, and kind of out there, then you might see an, another wave of, of schools kind of moving up and, and moving around. But um, you know, a lot of it does kind of come down to uh, can can school you know conferences like the OVC can they find the right fit, the right partners? You, know, you mentioned the America East. I think that that is definitely one to kind of keep an eye on. And I mean, well, I'll, I'll take us back to a conversation we've had uh, a couple times with with a few different people. I mean, there, there could be some Canadian and uh, you know universities end up making the the jump into Division One. I. I know that's been been talked about with with a few folks. Um, so uh, I think there's a lot of options on the table for a lot of leagues. But ultimately, what ends up transpiring between now and say July, uh, I think is is, is going to be uh, something to kind of keep track of because it, it could be anybody's guess in terms of when schools actually pull that trigger. Yeah, I, I want to talk about you, you raised. I think two important points there um, about both Canada, which uh, which is, uh, incidentally is something that a couple of our readers also asked about, and, and the administrative structure a little bit. And I want to talk about those. But before I do, I very deeply want to also talk to you very quickly about home field apparel, the, a, a subject near and dear to both of our hearts. Not just because they give us an enormous briefcase full of money. Every, no, they don't do that. They do give us some money, uh, and sometimes they give us stuff. But but they also make extremely comfortable clothes, clothes that have great, unique, interesting conversation starter logos from your favorite uh, universities, athletic departments, uh, or or ones that you don't really feel about passionately one way or the other. But the the colors are cool, or the logos are cool, like this Marquette hoodie that I'm wearing. Marquette's fine. Hey, you know, I, I like I like Great Lake institutions. I can appreciate a fine Jesuit university. I've been there before, but I, I can't say that I have deep emotional attachment to the institution or or, or their basketball team. But this hoodie's great. The logo's great. Everyone loves baby blue. Um, they just released Illinois uh, last week. They are about to release Villanova. I have seen some of the mock-ups of those designs. Uh, they're hilarious. We all love animals playing sports. Uh, we all love animals looking ridiculous. Look at that. That's an anteater. Um, yeah, I believe this, the, the, the Zot shirt here uh, is, is even as part of their 30% off sale. So if, if you go right now, there's a lot of stuff that's already discounted. So by all means, I, I think now is a great time if you want to get on and as well as using that uh, additional promo code. I, I know. I don't know what the promo code stack. There's only one way to find out, and that's buy a bunch of stuff from Homefield. They do it. They are discounting uh, some of their previous inventory. I have the uh, the Irvine Surfing Anteater sticker on my laptop. Um, they also sell extra point shirts. So if you're looking up the top there and think, "Wow, what a what a wonderful bag man!" I would wish I had a old timey Tulane football player uh, carrying a gigantic bag of money with the dollar bills flying around there. Well, guess what? You can buy a T-shirt that that has that exact thing on it from HomeFieldApparel.com. Uh, so when you buy all of those things there, because you love this podcast, because you love comfortable, unique, interesting clothes, um, you should use promo code Extra Points 
all one word. You save 15% off your first order. Will that stack with the 30%? I don't know. Try it and find out. Uh, but there's a bunch of stuff there that is more affordable than it normally is. So you should definitely buy it. And y y your friends and, and your enemies will uh, uh, compliment you on, on, on how on how well-dressed that you are, which is, I think, what we're all trying to do right now. Uh, big, big, big fans. And and also, yeah, just, just putting this out here, uh, we happily shill for home field because we legitimately love the product um we'd be happy to shill for other stuff too that we like you can drop me an email at uh, sales at extra points uh we are happy to send you a rate card give you some audience information if you want to reach an audience of diehard college sports fans thought leaders administrators reporters and i say this with the deepest love of my heart giant dorks uh, you can do that for an affordable rate by going to sales at uh, extrapointsmb.com. Going back here to Division II, um, I remember before the NCAA convention, I talked to a bunch of Division II conference leaders. I talked to some athletic directors and people at the Division I level about, hey, are, are you worried that there's going to be a stampede of schools trying to leave? And by and large, people at Division II said, not, not really. I mean, we kind of know that Grand Valley eventually is going to end up moving up. They don't really look like um, some of the other schools here, just like we knew that, you know, North Dakota and North Dakota State were eventually going to do that, too. And we can survive. Um, but I've heard some say uh, we wouldn't hate it if it was actually easier to move up or easier to move down. Um, uh, right now it's, it's kind of, we're going to talk about this more next week. It's a logistically onerous process. Uh, you have to pay fees. You have to sit out of championship access for several years. Um, you have to basically get a, a, a colonoscopy of, from other administrators to come in and look at every different part of your department. And that means that once, if you actually get up to that level, you definitely don't want to leave, even if that might make more strategic sense for your department. So I imagine if if administrators wanted to make it impossible to move they could um i've heard it is less likely that there'll be a moratorium on move ups but it's still possible like that's i think that that uh, is what incentivized several schools to jump up right now but i wouldn't be shocked if actually when this these new constitutions are written that it's not quite as it's not you're not going to put up a Berlin Wall or, or some kind of ironclad barrier to, to, per, that, to prevent people from, from moving around. So like it, may, it might actually be more fluid than it is right now. Yeah, I, I think that's especially important for a lot of schools out west, you know, in particular, sure. because there's just a lack of them. And so I think if they were able to kind of maybe, uh, you know, be involved uh, a little bit more at, with some of their peers, you know, certainly locally, regionally um, at, at the D1 level, I, I think that would interest a few schools that uh, certainly from a finance standpoint, probably can't make the full jump with with all their athletic departments. But, um, you know, the, we talk so much about you know, schools in the Northeast making the jump. Obviously, the, the South has, has just had an explosion uh, of, of programs themselves that have kind of just been universities that have been created the last couple of years um, that are looking to kind of have that. Uh, upward trajectory but um you know west is a little bit of a different ball game just uh given the distances involved and uh, I, I know of at least uh, you know one or two universities that you know would, would at least consider you know a, a big time jump if yep. they can be at least flexible in terms of you know who you know who where they land and, and and ultimately what programs can can do that but you know we're starting to see some of that flexibility kind of already on display i mean you you wrote that story a couple of weeks ago I had to, had a connect series in terms of uh you know women's hockey and uh some of the changes that have been gone on with uh, you know multi-divisional uh programs uh, you know yeah. kind of spanning things so i i think you could see some additions that yeah maybe there's there's a restriction or two attached to to things so there's not just like a a mass jump into division one basketball or something like that but um yeah i could certainly see for sports like um, you know, the you know, hockey already, obviously, you know, volleyball is going to uh, spend some divisions as well. So I, I, I could see some some issues like with that, um, that, that that pop up from now and then that uh, you will allow uh, certain programs to have the flexibility um, if they, they are a big basketball school, if they're a big volleyball school, if they're a big, uh, they, they have a wrestling program, a rowing program that, that can compete uh, at the highest level, you know, they, they can go for it. The, the uh, well, other part of that question that uh, we just very briefly talk about is, hey, has anybody else in Canada looked into this? And I know, I, I, you know, you know, I, I think we've, we've, we've raised this point somewhat facetiously, but not entirely about, you know, McGill is an elite, uh, AA, you know, AAU caliber, elite global research institution. They have college football. They, 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 they play college sports. Anybody want to grab McGill or the University of Toronto? 
for out west, I mean, uh, uh, Alberta plays college sports. And it's would anybody want to do that? Simon Fraser does. Uh, they play football. They are horrific. Uh, they are one of the worst Division two institutions right now. And 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 I and I have been told that nothing is imminent on any front at that point. And part of it is honestly, the world has made it harder for this to happen because everyone's got to get passports. Uh, in, in, international travel in the age of COVID, even if it's just between America and Canada, is much harder. If you have a uh, political leaders in either country that decide to uh, have a world where border restrictions become more onerous or where visas become harder to come by, that makes these things harder. And that's just, it's a lot of hoops to jump through for teams that are not going to be good. Um, they might be great academically. They might be great for enhancing the cultural and global experience of athletes, but uh, it's it's a lot. So I think you would need some structural changes uh, to make this more attractive, right? Yeah, and I, I think it would certainly make sense from a Canadian university standpoint in terms of getting additional you know enrollment. We, we talked so much uh, already on this this podcast and, and you on extra points in terms of you know a lot, a lot of these programs are really designed to to get students in the university door and get them yeah. tuition. And um, you know, given just the the population limitations, given the population pool here in the United States uh, of students that do go to college, you know, I think that would would love that not only that abroad experience, but but kind of studying at a Canadian university, maybe they have a, you know, family members up there or whatnot. You know, I, I think it could make sense. Um, you know, and, and we've certainly seen some elite athletes uh, come out of these, these Canadian uh, universities end up getting drafted end up going to the CFL and then the NFL. I mean, like, um, you know, there's that kind of cross pollination uh, over the border and you can certainly understand uh, as, as sports itself has become much more of a, a global enterprise um, in, in all manners. Uh, it would make some sense uh, if you're a, Certainly, a upwardly mobile Canadian university uh, that does want to kind of dip into to the uh, the transporter market a little bit more. Sports is is definitely a way to kind of get yourself on the map. Yep, that that's true. So you know, University of Toronto, if you're listening, one, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, and, and two, my email is matt at extrapointsmb.com. Uh, real quick, want to hit one last question for something that really probably should be an entirely uh, different newsletter, but I, I, I do want to kind of float this in here because it ties a bow and some other things we talked about this week. Uh, reader Darren asks, hey, uh, how long is it going to take to change the student culture institution to make them care about sports? Great question, Darren. Uh, if you are an athletic director and you uh, would like to know the answer to that question, uh, that's something that if we knew we could conclusively and definitively fix, we would charge you twenty thousand dollars for it. Um, that that it, it's that change. How you do that varies so much from school to school. Um, I've talked about it a little bit on this podcast. I wrote a big long newsletter uh, uh, behind the paywall for Extra Point subscribers earlier this week about how Grand Canyon is able to do it, and one of the reasons that they're able to do it, not to spoil the the whole story. Uh, is that it's a it's a uh, school that spent a lot of money on building a residential campus culture where athletes and students are integrated on uh, multiple levels and you have a population that joins stuff. I think it would be a big challenge, the biggest challenge to create a culture that was very invested in sports if you were a commuter school or if you were a school that was primarily targeting uh, non-traditional students. And we have a couple of those at, at the division one level. Cause look, man, like it's one thing to be really invested into a college basketball game when you're 20. And that's the biggest thing going on in your life. But when you're 27 and you got a wife and two kids and a full-time job, and now you have to come back to care about Montana state. Like that's hard. Um, even if you only need to activate a small percentage of that school, changing that requires, I think really uh, a decade. Like that, that's something where you're going to have to win, which means you're probably going to have to have a, a culture that spans over multiple coaches, because if you're a school that doesn't have that culture and you start winning, that coach is going to leave and, and then you're going you're to have to replicate that. So that's a difficult thing to do. You have to have an athletic department that puts in resources to create an engaging in-game experience, uh, independent of what's happening on the court or, or the field. All of the schools that have successful student sections are ones where students go for each other. They go because their friends are there. They go because that is that is a part of the social experience. They go because they care about the people on the field, not just because they want to see a winning football game or because they've been bribed with an activation. That takes a long time. That's inertia is a, is a slow force. You got to cycle that student body in or out. I can't think of a ton of examples off the top of my head where that's happened. I know that it has, but a place where that they had no student interest to a point where they had a high degree of student interest, like maybe UCF. Um, 
there, there, there aren't very many of those. Like the places like Cincinnati and Houston, UCF, those have been enormous university changes that have happened over several years. Am, am I missing somebody important here? Well, I mean, UCF was, was certainly top of mind just as, as we were talking. And, and uh, I'm in USF as well, another young football program that uh, I think has gotten the buy-in from, you know, kind of the larger, you know, Tampa St. Pink, you know, community as well. Yeah. You know, I think that, that's important. You kind of had the community buy-in in addition to your alumni base. I think that's huge. I think obviously it starts with the president and, and kind of the board of regents, you know, not only making it a priority, um, but making sure it is a, like you said, multi-generational kind of priority to where it's kind of started, starts from right when you step on campus as a freshman, uh, all the way through as, as a great experience uh, while you're on campus, but also when you're coming back and, you know, part of the giving process and the, and the fundraising process, you know, yeah. it's all got to be focused, you know, in terms of uh, creating that, that culture, like you said. And, and I think it's going to be important for uh, a lot of schools to, you know, not just create that out of thin air, but, uh, you know, make sure that's reinforced. You know, I think that that's the other thing, you know, sometimes it can kind of wax and wane depending on maybe who is the head coach and maybe who is the athletic director. Um, you know, if, if it's university wide and you're talking about from the board of regents on down, um, you know, I, I think you can make some waves in, in, in about a decade or, or at least 15 years. Uh, but it, it does take some time, you know, and I think for a lot of folks that they want that quick fix, they, they want that, um, you know, Florida Gulf Coast kind of NCAA tournament run to get everybody excited. But uh, that, that those things do not come along uh, all that often. And I think it is uh, just a constant reinforcement uh, that, that you have to have. And uh, a lot of it does start just from from your leadership in, in university and, and really the investment that they have to make in terms of that product, um, you know, for going to going to the games on campus themselves to coaching salaries to uh, really that student athlete experience as well. You know, you got to make sure that the athletes themselves, the, the ones that are kind of putting on that that entertainment product, uh, that they're bought in as well. Because if, if they're not, they're just kind of going through the motions. Uh, that definitely shows up on the, on the court and uh, down the road as well. So uh, it, it is a holistic, uh, I think, question that uh, deserves a holistic answer. Yeah, I I, uh, I unquestionably agree. It's the same. If you want to eat a dinosaur, you do it one bite at a time. And unless you're Fred Flintstone, you can't eat the entire dinosaur all at once. Making a gigantic institutional shift is eating a big-ass dinosaur. Um I think that's a good place to kind of wrap this up, I think. Uh, right. So, um, everyone, <laughs> thanks for listening. We have some exciting podcasts planned for you with some interesting guests over the next week or two before we uh, we start hitting the road again uh, ahead of conference tournaments for men's and women's basketball. You can, of course, find the Extra Points newsletter at extrapointsmb.com. You can make all of this support everything we're trying to do. We make a lot of stuff. We do a lot of interviews. We write a lot of newsletters. We make a lot of podcasts. We're able to do it. Um, because of people like you who are reading and listening and uh, subscribing and ideally writing us gigantic checks as potential corporate sponsors. Those are, those are great too. We, we appreciate all of the support. Uh, and uh, you can find me at Matt Brown EP on twitter.com. Brian, where can they find what you're doing? Well, on the, uh, on the twitter.com my website as well, uh, Brian, B R Y N F I S C H E R is the best place to find me along with uh, a lot of the work and, and on top of collegiate sports connect, uh, go ahead and, and sign up. A, a link is in the show notes, uh, yep. sign, up that, sign up for D one ticker, uh, and, and please you know, rate review, uh, this, this podcast. If you're not already a subscriber, uh, please do so as well. Uh, we're on Apple, we're on Spotify, wherever they, they allow you to rate us, give us, give us those five stars. It really does matter. If you can leave a review, that's even better. Um, you can, even, you know, Go ahead and leave a review. Mention your your favorite university, but maybe your favorite favorite football game you've ever been to. So just just leave something on there for us. Uh, we, we we would appreciate that, and uh, it helps other people find this podcast, which hopefully you're finding interesting as well. Yeah, that's that that's right. Again, we want those reviews to look like Alabama or Texas A and M recruiting classes. We want this to look like we are dropping enormous NIL bags. That's what we want. No, we don't want any of this Division Two no star stuff. Uh, we love you, Division II schools. We'll talk about you all the time. Everyone, thanks so much for listening. Uh, I got to get going. You got to get going. We've got more. Uh, you got to do some more digging in the content mines. We'll catch up with you next week. 